Okay guys, I want to show you how to load a cache sequence and then use the velocity of that cache sequence as a force to drive running Phoenix simulations. So this has been in the Phoenix to-do list for quite a while and uh, just the other day I figured out that actually Phoenix could already do this. So it's just a matter of creating uh, and connecting several nodes but today I'm using Phoenix Nightly from the 27th of October, it's Nightly 31068, uh, but you can also use another version of Phoenix in order to get the same effect. So I'm going to do this in two steps. So first off, I'm going to create my cache sequence with velocities, and then I'm going to run a simulation and affect it with these velocities. So you can just skip the first step if you already have velocities, but in this case, I'm just going to generate a cache sequence with a 3ds max vortex force so i'm going to place it inside this empty simulator phoenix is going to warn me that the simulation would be affected by vortex 001 and i'm going to accept this this warning shows up because i could be affecting for example particle fall particles uh, with this force and i might not be expecting that it would by default affect the fluid inside the phoenix simulation but in this case this is exactly what i want so i'm going to agree everything is fine everything is under control i'm going to show the velocity stream wise and see what happens so the vortex force has already begun working and it's starting to form this funnel and uh, the velocity stream wise preview gives us a very good idea of what is actually happening so i'm going to go into the simulation rollout and here is the velocity and we also have uh, temperature and smoke inside of this cache so i'm going to go to the output rollout and just turn them off uh, they are getting written to the cache but they don't actually contain any meaningful values so they don't need to take up space on your hard drive and you can also zero the backup interval so this way the simulation could be faster it could write caches faster and they would take up less space so this simulation is just under uh, 1 million voxels so it's a very low res and it's done so here is how it works so I've generated a cache sequence with velocity and uh, you could uh, you could use any kind of cache sequence you could load aura files into the Phoenix simulator through the input rollout uh, you could load VDBs or you could load F3D files and as long as they contain velocity, uh, they are going to be good for the task that we are doing right now. So uh, in case uh, you are loading velocities from somewhere else, you uh, are just starting from this point on. So I'm just going to remove the vortex uh, force and just leave this Phoenix simulator with the, the loaded caches inside of it. So I'm going to create the second simulator that we are actually going to affect. And uh, I'm going to name it Smoke, like this. And I'm also going to rename the first simulator to a more meaningful name, like Loader. Okay, so uh, in order to show that something is going on in the second simulator, I would create this box and I would connect it to a Phoenix source and emit some smoke in it. So I'm going to switch to volume brush, switch off temperature. I don't want any fire to get emitted. I don't want it to start rising up. I just want to create smoke that stands still and is ready to be affected by the velocity. So uh, the other thing that uh, you should watch out, especially when you have uh, intersecting simulators in uh, the same scene, is that you have to go to the C interaction rollout and uh, sometimes uh, exclude stuff from one simulator or the other simulator. So in this case, I don't want the smoke simulator to interact with the water simulator. Because by default, when a Phoenix simulator sees another Phoenix simulator, it tries to uh, work with it as if the other simulator was a mesh. So uh, Phoenix would try to find uh, some kind of surface inside of the simulator is going to look for the uh, the surface defined here by the surface channel that is uh, uh, usually used for meshing liquids 
and uh, you can also mesh smoke with it. So it's going to try to find that surface and just act as if the other simulator was some kind of deforming mesh. But in this case, we don't want this to happen. So we want to somehow read this velocity into the smoke simulator. So I would exclude it in order to not have any unexpected effects. And also I can, uh, I can exclude the box and uh, the Phoenix uh, source from the water simulator so that I just don't accidentally hit start on it. And uh, because it, we are not actually going to use its simulation capabilities, it's just going to be a water here in the scene. Uh, okay, so next I'm going to create a Phoenix grid texture. So with this Phoenix grid texture, I'm going to pick the water simulator like this, and then the grid texture, it reads the different grid channels from a Phoenix simulator. So in this case, I want to read in the grid velocity. Okay, so uh, I'm going to create now a Phoenix mapper. So the Phoenix mapper, the idea behind it is that it reads a certain texture map. So you could uh, input any kind of map here and, and it's going to uh, just uh, imprint it and it's going to affect any other uh, running Phoenix simulator uh, with this texture map. So you can, for example, you can map the smoke and the temperature with some kind of noise texture during simulation and you can uh, do all kinds of crazy stuff. In this case, I'm going to map the velocity of any running simulator with the Phoenix grid texture like this. Okay, so if I start the smoke simulator right now, it's going to create smoke in the box. I'm going to turn off the streamline preview on the water simulator. And now you can see that something starts to happen here with the smoke. So I can even enable the, uh, enable the GPU preview and see that something starts to happen with the smoke emitted from the box. So I created the smoke simulator a bit wider in order to show you something that you should watch out for. So you can see that something happens here, but it doesn't quite work right. So if I enable the velocity streamlines in the smoke simulator, you can see that actually here is already a funnel starting to form. So some of something got read uh, by the water sim, um, by the smoke simulator, uh, but it's not exactly right. And the reason for this is because when we created the grid texture, by default, it's using object XYZ. And this means that uh, whatever object the grid texture gets mapped on, uh, it's just going to place the data in its own object space. So in order to respect the actual position of the water simulator, uh, here we can switch this to world XYZ. So I will stop the smoke simulation, start it all over again, and now the velocities are in the right place. So now they should start stirring up the smoke created in the uh, here in the box. I would also uh, turn off auto reduction and uh, decrease the detail reduction down to zero so that we can see all of the uh, simulation voxels. And here it is. So here the smoke starts circling around and it's going to start get drawn in by the funnel. And uh, this is it. So there are something that some things that you should watch out for. So first off, you should watch out for the uh, the kind of mapping coordinates. So you should use world X, Y, X, Y, Z. Then there is the tiling mode. So by default, it's single clamped. And this means that uh, whenever velocity or any kind of data that you read through the uh, grid texture touches the wall of the walls of the uh, of the original simulator uh, it's going to just extend infinitely into space in that direction so if you want uh, the data to, to just simply end at the borders of the simulator you should just uh, switch to uh, using the single tiling mode 
Okay, so here you can see that the simulation has already progressed quite far and the smoke has really started getting rotated by the velocity right from the water simulator and it's even uh, started to get thrown out of the original box and into the larger uh, simulator, so it works. But uh, another parameter that you could use uh, in order to control this is right here in the mapper you have the build-up time. So this is a very important parameter as well. It means that whatever gets uh, read here uh, from the texture map, uh, it's going to take some time until uh, it gets applied fully. So by default, uh, this time is one second. So it's going to build up over one second until uh, it reaches the full velocity uh, that is read from the original simulator. So I could reduce this down to zero in order to make the simulation just apply the velocity fully and immediately. So uh, this way is going to be very much like, uh, uh, for example, the new Phoenix Massive Wave Force where it has the, the option to control the liquid freedom. So uh, that option, it would, uh, it would just balance between uh, how much of the force is actually forced upon the simulator and just replaces the, the natural velocity of the fluid and how much freedom uh, actually the, the fluid has to do its own fluid thing. So this parameter is, is working in quite a similar way and you can see how different the shape of the uh, smoke affected by the velocity is this time. So now the, uh, the velocity that, that has been read uh, from the original simulator is just being forced onto this smoke and it doesn't really allow it to do uh, too much of its own fluid thing. So uh, the shape and the behavior is quite different. And you can also notice that uh, the smoke just ends right here in the bounds of the uh, original water simulator and it's not getting thrown out of it anymore. So uh, by controlling the build-up time, you can uh, really control uh, a different, a different ways that the simulator can work. So here it is, the timeline has ended. And you can see that we are getting a much, much different simulator simulation this time. Okay, so uh, basically this is how this technique works. So thank you for watching and until next time.